Call the meeting to order. Do we have an invocation? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, time that we can gather together where decisions can be made uh, for the betterment of this community. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. Lord, we pray that wisdom would prevail. Pray that if there is conflict, uh, Lord, that it will be resolved. God, we pray that, that uh, you would give wisdom to each person that makes decisions today. Lord, we thank you that you are uh, amidst, uh, that are, you are in our midst, and uh, Lord, we, we pray your blessing upon it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Um, Slightly, I think the executive session, we, we had published one agenda and realized that we had a mistake on it, so went to republish it. I'm not sure if it made it out in the public's eye or not, so I just wanted to state that the executive session that we have has the incorrect title. It's supposed to be confidential business data, not acquisition of real estate. So I don't okay. know if we, but I believe that yours is correct up here, but yeah. I just want to make that okay. clear. Okay, thank you. I need to make a motion. I'd move to approve the agenda as amended. I have a motion from Chuck to approve the changes in the agenda. We have a second? Second. Second from Keaton. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Public comments. This time where, is, is a time where citizens are encouraged to speak publicly. We request that you come to the podium and state your name and address, speak respectfully, and limit your comments to three minutes. Do we have any public comments? Okay, Ty. Uh, hi, Commissioners. I'm Ty Gannett. Uh, my address is 928 East 9th Street. Um, you all can come visit me whenever you'd like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm here tonight to uh, just get some clarification on um, the BYOB uh, um, drinking at uh, the Plaza on Fall Fest. Um, you know, I, I have supported the plaza um, since day one. I put my blood, sweat, and tears in to help build it. Um, as a business, uh, I've, supported, um, I've supported it in every way I could possibly could. Um, last year, I was uh, one of the uh, people that helped spearhead the drinking district. Um, and uh, last year, you know, three businesses had a chance to make money on, on that drinking district. And I, I understand we, um, we had a couple blunders. And um, I think, uh, you know, if, if that was to happen again this year, you know, we would, we would do our best to make sure those blunders didn't happen. Um, you know, when, when you try new things, all you can do is, is uh, try them and, and get better and learn from them. Um, I have approached um, the plaza director. I've approached uh, several plaza board members. And the only explanation that I've gotten is, well, this is what we're going to do this year. Um, I kind of feel like um, the plaza went behind, um, went behind people's backs on, on this decision. Um, uh, I think this decision, uh, you know, to bring King Midas in and, and make it a BYOB event was uh, hastily decided um, right after uh, Fall Fest last year. I can't pin a date on it. Um, um, and uh, I'm sorry, what? Okay. And so I guess um, I just I just wonder why why we're doing this. Uh, you know, in a BYOB event, you know, nobody has a chance to make money. Um, I've talked, I've talked to the liquor stores. You know, it's it, they're not spearheading it. Um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering. I'm just trying 
to find an explanation. Okay. So, thank thanks you for Ty. your time. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Any other public comments? Gary? My name's Gary D. Jerry. I live at 826 West 8. Um, Walmart is in city limits. Am I correct on that? Mm -hmm. I believe so. All right. As you come up the east driveway, look to the west up the wall. Them flowers are all nodding thistles. Who takes care of that? The city or else it's Walmart? That's a noxious weed. When you get that weed, go, when them start going down in our pond before they're going to be in the city, and then people's going to be after the city. I think that it's an issue that needs to be looked at. Thank you for your time, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments? Okay. Thank you. Proclamations. Um, Campbell and Johnson 50 year anniversary recognition. Do I need to read the pro proclamation? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's have you read the proclamation. Can I add? So can I add stuff in as I go? <laughs> <laughs> Only good stuff. And I just want to make it clear: I was not here when they started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I knew you when they started. So. <laughs> Whereas Campbell and Johnson Engineers is celebrating its 50th anniversary as a company in Con the city of Concordia and whereas Campbell and Johnson Engineers was founded by Paul Johnson and Ralph Campbell and is now comprised of second and third generations and whereas Paul and Ralph since the first day they opened their business dedicated themselves to providing the best service to each and every one of their customers and whereas staff continues to carry on the tradition of exemplary service which has been their trademark since they began their business in 1969 and whereas the company has served as a city engineer since its inception providing professional services for consultation design and construction inspection for public infrastructure projects in the city of Concordia and whereas Campbell and Johnson welcomed its 50th anniversary on June 7th at the Broadway Plaza by inviting the community to help celebrate. Now therefore be it resolved by the governing body of the city of Concordia Kansas the mayor commissioners and staff of the city of Concordia hereby congratulate Campbell and Johnson engineers for its lifelong commitment to our community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, sir.
<laughs> okay. Eric, you need help out to your car? <laughs> Cloud Village budget request. My name is Sheila Jackson and I'm the property manager for the housing authority which consists of Cloud Village. Uh, we are low income housing for the disabled, uh, elderly or handicapped in our community. And first of all I want to thank the commission for uh, adding us to your budget the last two years. Uh, that was the first time we have received money from the city and it's been a tremendous help. Uh, we've been able to do a lot of extra updates and repairs that have been needed done that's been put off for <coughs> several years. So um, some of the repairs that we've done, we've replaced all of our bedroom windows, which were the original from 1978 when the place was built. So they're energy efficient and now they're um, egress, they beat egress codes. So if there's a fire, they can get out their bedrooms. Um, we've replaced some exterior doors as needed and along with uh, flooring we're replacing carpet when it needs to come up with the vinyl plank flooring and we've done a total of four total rehabs to different apartments so that money really helps us get some of these repairs done when we add it to the money that we have coming in uh, we had our on-site state inspection in April and they were very impressed with our updates and, and how we've been improving the property. In fact, at the following month at our annual uh, meeting, they specifically mentioned our property and how Im impressed they were with our repairs and updates. So again, we appreciate any money. You know, it, it really helps. We're nonprofit, so um, some of our goals that we would like to continue replacing the living room and dining room windows as we have funds because those again are the original as well as we have uh, concrete areas that need updated or improved. We have uh, raised areas that are trip hazards, things like that. And with all of our rain, we found we have drainage issues that we need to address. So these are things that are on our goals to try to meet and as well as the state, those are things the state want, wants us to work towards as well. So um, this year we are asking for a slight increase if you would allow uh, to make a total of $6,200 we're requesting. That would just kind of offset some of the management fees and just help us continue with our improvements. So um, that's, the, that's my request. Um, I also would like to just kind of put a bug in the commissioner's ears to maybe at some point down the line put on your agenda the concern with the ownership of the property. As it stands right now, um, the housing authority owns the property based on what our loan is. And the loan will be up in nine years. So typically what happens is either the property sold after that because you don't get funding from the state anymore for low income, or you could keep it as a for-profit property. But so if it reverts to the housing authority, that means just board members on the housing authority would get that profit. But if we could change in our bylaws that it reverts to the city, then if we sold that property, the city would get any income off of that or if you rented it for profit. But that's just something that I think needs to be addressed. You know, nine years will be gone before you know it. So, um, and then also we, tried to kind of look back. The housing authority was formed in 1970 and it was formed by the city commission as an agent of the city. So how that would be interpreted, I don't know, but to me that sounds like we're part of the city. So that's just something for if you guys could put on your agenda at some point to discuss. Okay. Any questions? Not this time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Sheila. Appreciate it.
Frank Carlson Library budget request. Hello. Hello. Well, my name is Denise DeRoche for Reynolds, and oh, the library you. board has asked <coughs> me to come this evening to present the library's budget request to you. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to do this and also thank all of the commissioners who have so faithfully come to library board meetings over the years. I think that will make my presentation uh, a little easier this evening. Um, we do have a budget. I don't know if you've got a copy. If not, I do. Um, we have it, you yeah. got it up? Okay. Okay, okay great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our budget request because 2020 is different from previous years. Um, it's different because there have been some changes and one of the big changes has to do with some funding that looks like we are getting an enormous increase from the Central Kansas Library System. If you look at the appropriations, City of Concordia of course is in red and the Central Kansas Library System of which we are a member is the, um, the entity below that and it looks like we're getting a tremendous increase. And what is really happening is that the Central Kansas Library System subsidizes our courier. We use courier service to uh, send materials from one library to another. We use that very heavily and they have subsidized it for m several years. They have now decided that rather than write a check to the courier, the Central Kansas Library System is writing the check to the library. And we were surprised by this in 2019 because the money came and then we had to pay the courier. So it looks like we're getting a big increase of $3,700, but if you look a little farther down where it says supplies and postage, yep, there's a $3,000 increase because that's basically pass-through funding. Mm -hmm. They're just giving it to us so that we can just pay somebody else. I, I do not understand why they're doing it and I have asked so if you have further questions for me on that point I'll do my best to answer them but um, the explanation was basically so people understood how much the courier service cost uh, anyway so um, we also have a, a modest increase in personnel to allow for a cost of living increase for our 11 employees um, we also have an increase in books and other materials. Our spending on books, our budget for books and other materials has stayed steady. Uh, it looks uh, to be the same in 2017. I can tell you that it remained steady for several years prior to that as well. And the library board feels that it's time to increase that just a little bit so that we can continue to deliver new materials to the public. And that means not just books, but ebooks, other electronic uh, downloadable things, as well as DVDs and playaways, audiobooks. Uh, the variety of materials that we supply for patron use is always growing rather than shrinking. So if you, and I'm not sure, I think there's a second page that shows our totals. Mm -hmm. Yes, there we go. so there it is. And um, we do have a, a <coughs> note there that up to $12,000 will be placed in our capital improvement fund if, if it's possible. So that is something that we have tried to do to save for the future. And I believe you have a little uh, receipt that shows some of the projects we've done over the past five years. The Frank Carlson Library in 2015 redid the air conditioning system to put in a more efficient system. In 2016, we put in our electronic sign, which has just been a wonderful way to communicate with the public. In 2017, we replaced our exterior shingles, and they are now much more fireproof than they used to be. And speaking of fires, this year we have replaced the entire fire alarm system that I think last year I was talking to you a little bit about that it was from 1976, it was original to the building, and at last we have a modern fire alarm system in our building. It's just been a wonderful pr 
project to complete. We did all that for the total cost of $73,528, and we did not come to you asking you to please, please help us to offset these costs, particularly the fire alarm and the air conditioning system. Um, I know that there has been a question about what, what do we do with capital improvements. Well, in five years, $73,528 has been spent on capital improvements, and I think it has made a difference to our patrons and to our building. And definitely our staff feels a lot better to know that we have adequate fire alarm protection at this point. So if you don't have questions about uh, the regular budget, then I think we need to talk also about the benefit fund request. And I believe you've got the benefit fund request too. If not, I've got a copy. Okay. Now the benefit fund request, uh, first of all, the benefit, the benefit fund uh, is something that the state of Kansas legislature uh, allows libraries to establish and for cities to fund to pay benefits and that's all that can be used this money can't be used for anything else if we have you know a disaster in our library or hit with a tornado we cannot dip into benefit fund money to pay for that it is only for benefits well in in 2019 we requested fifty six thousand four hundred and thirty four dollars uh, we came up with a request of $65,168 for 2020, and then the library board looked at this, and we, we revised it down, and, and we talked a lot about it. But the, the two big shockers in this are uh, unemployment. Um, unemployment for at least 30 years. We have been paying into the unemployment fund only the minimum allowed by law and so no equity was built up and when we had an unemployment claim then we did not have the equity that we needed and so in 2019 we have been paying uh, about it'll be about thirty five thousand thirty five hundred dollars in 2019 but again we didn't come to you and say please help us but we are coming to you in in 2020 because we feel very strongly that um, it's going to take about three years to build up equity and we are locked in for that period of time and we don't ever want to be in this position again where we see a rise from one hundred and thirty dollars a year to thirty five hundred that's that's just a devastating increase which we have absorbed this year but we're asking for your help with this for 2020 the other big change is health insurance. Health insurance, as you know, uh, those costs do continue to rise. Because the library employees are not city employees, we are a subdivision of municipal government, but we are not, we're not you. <laughs> so um, because of that, we have to have our own group for health insurance purposes, and other insurance for that matter. Well, a few years ago, we were able to join the state employee health plan. But there are two variables for 2020. One is how much are insurance costs going to rise? And if you know, please let me know, because no one really knows for sure. Um, the estimates from the state are not going to be available. They aren't available quite yet. So we'll have our budget request submitted to you before we know what actual figures are going to going to look like. But the second big question has to do with a news item uh, previously, or, or I should say earlier this month, whether our plan will see a reduction due to the Kansas State Employees Health Care Commission rate cuts for 2020. We don't know if these rate cuts affect only state employees or if non-state plans in the state insurance group will also receive that benefit of, of reduced rates. So what we did is we revised down to 42,000 for health insurance. And if that, if we really gambled wrong, we will use money that we have 
from previous years have not been spent on benefits. If, if we're right and it's, and it's exact, well, wow, we <laughs> will be thanking you for funding it. Um, if we're overestimating, then we will reduce our request for next year because we don't want to build up funds in benefit funds that can only be spent for benefits if we don't have benefits to purchase with them. There are a couple other things that I'd like to tell you about because when we talk about budgets, we often talk just about the budget. But in 2017, I have statistics from um, the state library. Every year, libraries all over the state have to report information. So I'd like to share these charts with you. And just in a quick rundown, in 2017, these are the statistics that were reported to the State Library. And I took several libraries, Belleville, Beloit, and then five other libraries that are very similar in population to Concordia. In fact, they are the only five libraries in the state that are similar in population to Concordia, so I haven't, I haven't cherry-picked here. I've shown them all to you. And here you can see what the population is. If you look to the chart on the right, now you can see the total local library support and the mill levy rates. And that, I'm not gonna you know, go into great detail on this, but I think it's just kind of interesting that different libraries are supported at different levels. It's, it's interesting, and the mill levy rates are fascinating too. The local revenue per capita is also an interesting chart and that is on um, the lower left in red. We are definitely not the highest. In fact, we are one of the lowest, if not, well, we're the second lowest in per capita spending by local government. Um, the highest is Belleville, spending $73 per capita to support their library. Mm -hmm. Salaries and benefits are also fascinating to look at. This, again, based on 2017 statistics reported by the libraries to the state. Um, you can see that, again, Frank Carlson Library is kind of in the middle of the pack here in, in total spending on salaries and benefits. And then, if you turn the chart over, you'll see average employee compensation which unfortunately uh, a couple of the libraries did not report this in a way that was usable. And uh, if you don't know how many employees the library has, it's kind of hard to know what their per capita is. But again, we, we fall you know, it, toward the lower end uh, when you look at, at some of the other libraries, but we are definitely not, um, you know, not out of line here on, on uh, employee compensation. In fact, um, we, our average of $13,583 per employee is due to the fact that we have a lot of part-time employees, which is just wonderful because they bring such expertise and skill to the library. They allow us to be open and, and operational all of the hours that we are. But uh, in comparison to some of the other libraries, we are not, definitely not the highest paid. This is not a complaint. It's just statistics, which I think are, are very interesting. So at this point, I just want to remind you that we are busy at the library. Our summer reading program is in full swing. We've got Milford Lake uh, or Milford Nature Center coming tomorrow for a wonderful program for kids. We have in from January 1st until May 31st, we have had 906 P 
people come to library programs, and we have done outreach to daycares and preschools and reached 990 children that way. Um, we've sent 2,318 items out on interlibrary loan or received them, so we've had 2,318 interlibrary loan transactions. So we're averaging about 464 interlibrary loan transactions every single month. We have a large number of people using our electronic um, uh, ebooks and other downloadables. In fact, our ebook circulation averages 257 per month. Um, our computer use comes out to be approximately 415 people using our computers every single month. And then we have people who bring their own devices and use our wireless, and we have approximately 606 people using our wireless every month. So I think the Frank Carlson Library has been reaching our population. I'm so pleased with the support that we've gotten from the city. and. Uh, Thank you so much for being able to come and tell you a little bit about our library and how we stack up in the state of Kansas. So, thank you. Thanks, okay. Denise. Thank you. Thank you. Brown Grand Theater presentation. Moni. Hello. I'm Monty Wentz, and I currently serve as the president of the board of directors for the Brown Grant Opera House, Inc., and I'm joined by seven of our board members and our director here this evening. As you are aware, we manage and operate the Brown Grant under a management agreement between the board and the city, as we have since the board gave the building to the city in 1975. Under this agreement, we are charged with managing, operating, programming, restoring, and maintaining the Brown Grand Theater while receiving no financial compensation from the city of Concordia. The city does provide for the utilities and property insurance to cover the building. The remaining fun funding is made up from generous donations from the public and board, grants, revenue from the rental of the building and performances, and primarily from income generated by foundations that have been established to support the Brown Grand Opera House Incorporated. In 2011, then Kansas Governor Sam, Brown, Sam Brownback eliminated the Kansas Arts Commission, which closed the door to arts funding from the National Endowment for the Arts. This action eliminated operational grant funding for the Brown Grant in the amount of approximately $15,000 annually. In March of 2012, the Brown Grant was closed due to structural instability of the <coughs> stage and rigging areas. In 2014, the theater reopened after a $735,000 stage reinforcement that was done in cooperation with the city. That project was funded in part using historic tax credits. When that application was made by the Brown Grand Opera House Incorporated, it qualified for a 30% credit of allowed expenses. When those credits were awarded, they were awarded to the city at a rate of 25%, reducing the income by almost $30,000. At that time, the decision was made by the city not to appeal the credit rate and instead cover the total shortfall of approximately $58,000 themselves. That amount was then charged to the Brown Grand Opera House Inc. as a loan with an interest rate of 2%. The Brown Grand Board started making annual payments of $5,000 towards repayment of the loan to the city for a project that ensured the structural stability of a city-owned building. Those payments continued until June 2017 when after struggling to restart programming and fundraising after having the building closed for two years and with the cuts in operational grants from the Arts Commission, the city manager at that time informed the Brown Grand Board to stop making payments on that loan. We have since resumed making payments and have thus far made payments totaling $1,000 this year. During this same time frame, the city has also funded the construction of the Broadway Plaza, which in some cases directly competes with the Brown Grant. As you know, the city fully funds all of the maintenance of that facility, including the staff to do the maintenance and pays a management fee to Cloud Corp to run the, and program the events. This spring, the Brown Grand was approached by a grant writer for the Kansas Historical Theater Association, wanting to write a grant to fully fund projects in five member theaters across the state. We discussed possible projects and determined that a combination of making additions to our sound system and installing air conditioning and showers in some of the dressing rooms was a good fit. 
Our sound system was upgraded through a grant six years ago, as we have tried to increase the quality of shows that we bring in over the past few years. They have required sound equipment that we do not own. We have therefore had to rent equipment to supplement our current system, equipment that is not available to rent in Concordia. In addition, some of the current stage speakers that we do have no longer function properly. The second floor dressing rooms are not air conditioned, making them all been unusable during the summer and fall. There are no shower facilities in the Brown Grand. Often our contracts with touring companies require that we provide them with hotel rooms at our expense. Many of these performers have commented to us that they sleep on their tour buses and only require the hotel room to have a place to shower. They've stated that if we had shower facilities at the Brown Grand, there would be no reason that we would have to provide hotel accommodations for them. These items have been on our wish list for years, but have not been a priority for fundraising. Although they are things that would reduce our long-term cost of presenting shows, the board has always felt that there were more pressing needs to dedicate our fundraising resources to. When this grant opportunity arose, it was the perfect chance to attempt to meet this need without having to make funding requests from our local donors. We do realize that the dressing room modifications would require a building permit and have already discussed the procedure for that application should funding be awarded. The Brown Grand Board is also working on developing a plan for the replacements of the seats in the theater. The current seats were installed by the board in 1979 and have been removed from Pressor Hall in Lindsburg, Kansas. They were being replaced by Bethany College due to being at the end of their functional life expectancy at the same time the Brown Grand was being renovated. The board then refurbished those seats and used the ones that showed the least signs of wear and discarded the remaining seats. Forty years later, the best of those seats, which are now 93 years old, are wearing out. We are currently in the process of de developing a replacement plan, including what those seats will look like and how they will be funded. Initial de development of this plan includes determining the financial feasibility of the project. Portions of this include applying for initial grants that can be leveraged as local matches for larger regional grants. For this to be successful, we need support from the city management. In early 2019, the city manager asked that we make changes to our bylaws to add a city commissioner to our board. The city manager also asked that we come to the city and ask permission for any repairs or improvements we plan to make to the <coughs> building, including how we are going to fund those items before we do any fundraising. After much discussion with the city manager, we agreed that there was already a commissioner on the board and that we could not justify the expense of having an attorney rewrite our bylaws. We also agreed that we would make a yearly presentation to the city commission updating you on the status of the theater. In an effort to help keep the commission informed, we also started sending the minutes of our monthly meetings to the city manager and reminded her that she's always welcome to attend our meetings. However, we've been unable to get timely support for grant applications and it appears that the Brown Grand Board of Directors are expected to take all the responsibility for the physical and financial success or failure of the Brown Grand as volunteers, while apparently no longer having the authority to make necessary decisions on running the theater. The city manager has expressed to me that just as a renter, the Brown Grand Board does not have the right to make changes to the property without approval. I would argue that the Brown Grand Board is not a normal tenant and that this is reflected in the lease. If the city and the Brown Grand Board adhered to a normal lease structure, the theater would never have been restored. In fact, paragraph 11 of our lease states that the management corporation may not alter their structure in any way which would affect the historical significance of the premises without the prior written consent of the city. It is important to keep in mind that the goal of the Board of Directors of the Brown Grand Opera Housing is the restoration and preservation of the building something that we've been doing successfully since 1974. The current board consists of one member who was one of the three incorporators, a daughter of one of the original directors, and a grandson of one of the original directors. I've been on the board for 20 years, and I'm the grandson of the person that oversaw and directed the actual restoration. We have a city commissioner and the spouse of a city commissioner on the board. We have extensive expertise in and a vested interest in the continued success of the Brown Grand Theater. This board would like to continue the current lease agreement to manage, maintain, and run the theater as we have done successfully for the past 45 years. When we have a large project like the proposed seating project, 
We will bring it to the attention of the City Commission when it is a fully developed project. However, we cannot present a fully developed project before we have had a chance to work through all the details, which may include initial fundraising and grant writing to determine the financial feasibility of a project. In order to be successful, we need the city's support during this phase of the project. It is the opinion of the Brown Grand Board of Directors that we do not have an obligation to ask permission to apply for basic grants for the operation and maintenance of the theater. Those types of grants should have support from the city as it is in our mutual best interest to pursue every opportunity to maintain the facility, provide programming that is beneficial to the community, and generate a stream of revenue that will keep the theater operating well into the future. Furthermore, I would request that you consider forgiving the loan that you hold over the Save Our Stage project. The Brown Grand is unable to fundraise to pay off a loan where the beneficiary of the loan and the loan originator are the same entity. The only way the Brown Grand can make payments on that loan is to take that money out of operational income or by selling assets, something the loan documents discourage. You could look at the management fee you pay to run the Broadway Plaza, extrapolate that to the 45 years the <coughs> Brown Grand Board has managed your theater and consider the exchange as having gotten an excellent value for your investment. The Brown Grand hosted 7,500 7, visitors last year from nine states and several foreign countries. It provided entertainment for all ages, educational opportunities for many youth through the Missoula Summer Theater, Lovewell Theater Institutes, Youth for Music, and college productions. It served as a fundraising venue for important organizations like CASA and even a location for, he for healing and comfort in the unfortunate loss of people cherished in our community. In conclusion, the Board of Directors of the Brown Grand Opera House Incorporated ask for your support as we continue to work to provide cultural resources to the citizens of Concordia, Cloud County, and beyond. We ask you to support us in our efforts to make the best decisions for the theater moving forward, support our fundraising efforts, and attend our shows. Take another look. We are positively grand. Thank you, Moni. Thanks, Moni. Action agenda, uh, minutes for the June 5th meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes for the June 5th meeting? I have a motion from Sam. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Keaton. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Appropriation ordinance number 11. Do I have a motion to approve the appropriation ordinance? I move to approve appropriation ordinance number 11. I have a motion from Keaton. Do I have a second? A second. Second from Christy. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Approval of the design contractor for treatment plant phase two. Jeremy tonight because he's working on the sewer out there between on between Spruce and Olive and second and third trying to get that hooked up so um, as I understand it back in 2015 the Commission had discussed improvements to the wastewater treatment plant um, split into a couple of different phases phase one and phase two we recently completed phase one back in August of 2018 and are looking at what phase two is going to involve We've been talking through this for the past several months and have kind of finally decided on what that scope needs to be. But we're at a point now where we need to engage officially and formally with the design professional to be able to further refine that scope, put some detailed cost estimates rather than some budgetary estimates together right now, really decide what it's gonna take. Um, and that scope includes upgrades to the electrical facilities. Right now, the um, electrical backup generation, right now we have a backup generator that serves the lights in the administration building. If we were to experience a power outage for a significant amount of time, all processing would stop. We would bypass our facility and raw sewage would be dumped into the Republican River, which is something we don't want to have happen. So part of this project is to include a generator and rework the electrical system to be able to prevent that from happening so we can maintain compliance with KDAG. Another portion of the project would include um, 
work on an aeration basin, and I don't quite understand all the technical terminology, but it's another um, anaerobic anoxic zone that's created to help more efficiently process the sludge and get the water off the top and be able to clean it, clean it better and clean it faster. And then our influent pumps right now, we have three influent pumps on the influent side of things. One does not work, one is not working well, one does function. So what happens is that when, when we get inundated with a lot of water from a recent rain or a heavy usage, um, a busy weekend ar around our community, the pumps are overwhelmed and they don't operate as efficiently and we get more than what we can handle in that grit chamber and it takes longer to process it further down the line. So we need to make sure that we have all three pumps working properly and working optimally. Another portion of this is the biosolids processing and you've heard us talk a little bit about that. That's our choice between building a building um, to hold sludge and to dry it out in versus uh, another mechanized process that involves the processing of lime to turn it into a class A type soil. During phase one, we put in what's called a screw press and that takes out some of the water of, of the sludge and then it would go into the drying area or it would go into the oven. We need to have the um, engineer do a little bit more, more investigation and more work on that to help us decide and that's what we really need the study session for. We really need your help with, with that portion of it. Um, so we've done some research. We went up to Columbus, Nebraska. We visited their site um, and they have both the building and the oven piece. So we got to talk with them. They've had it in operation since 2004. So we had some really good conversations with them about operations and maintenance. Um, but we, and our engineer has done, took us up there. The engineer went with us there. She's doing some lab analysis on it, but she's as far as she can go, as far as her company will allow her without a formal contract. So then, um, we're at a point now where we need to ask you to, if we can formally go ahead and engage with professional engineering consultants out of Wichita to proceed a little bit further down the road to get us enough information to be able to work a study session with you to be able to figure out how we're going to proceed on that biosolids handling piece. The rest of it ne needs to happen to finish the upgrades and set us up for success for the next several decades here. Uh, to, uh, this is part of the inf infrastructure maintenance and improvement to keep us going. The other portion of it is that um, with, when the phase one was approved. Uh, the commission then authorized $10 a month to be added onto water bills. And that was to pay for phase one improvements. It also created a reserve in that account that's partially, Amber, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of a cushion required by the auditors to make sure that we have enough to cover payments. And it also started to help us to build funds to, for the future um, of phase two. And so then it was anticipated at that time that a little bit more would be added to the water bills during phase two. Now we haven't had a chance to talk with you about that. We need to talk with you about that during the study session to decide number one, how much based on what the cost estimates would be after the engineer gets a little further down the road and the timing of that when the implementation of that. So I'm not asking you to authorize that right now. We, we need more information. We need to have a study session on that. As a result of the $10 a month that was added to the water bill uh, back with phase one back in 2015, we can use some of that reserve funding that's already in the wastewater fund to be able to fund this design contract to get us a little bit down the road. As you can see in, in the write-up and in the contract, there's two different components to that. Um, as far as the contract goes, the design and the exploration piece of it is about $149,000, and then construction inspection is another $223,000. What we're looking at as we enter into this contract that we know we would have to expend would be starting in on that design services of the 149,000. The construction inspection services would not begin until after you authorize a construction contract, which would be after the design is done and after bids bids occur. So while we enter into this contract, it's basically saying we, we want the con we want the designer to proceed with exploring a little bit further, get us far enough on that we know what some estimates are, get us to the point where we can bid and see what the bids come in at. Um, PEC's also done a really good job. Our experience with phase one with them is that they only bill for what they have, the expenses that they have incurred. And so, again, with the construction inspection services, if the commission decides you don't want to proceed or you want to proceed with a different scope, we're not going to get billed for that until that actually happens. Typically on the design side of things, it is going to be um, lump sums based on percentages of completion of the work. So they won't be billing the 114 for design services, for example, on an hourly rate. It's going to be when they hit 25% design, 50% design, 75%, 100%, things of that nature. Does that make sense so far? Do, um, no, this is the people we, the PEC is the people we've used before. Yes. Correct? Yeah, the, yeah, and the, the design this, engineer that we used on phase one. Is this contract similar to the ones they've had in the past, or do you know? Yes. It yes. is? Mm -hmm. uh, has, have you looked at it, Justin? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any concerns or anything with the contract that anybody has? No, I reviewed it. This is uh, pretty standard stuff. It's nothing uh, too outrageous, and, and since it's just a design phase, mm -hmm. there's uh, 
certain ways that those contracts are broken is a, is, is a difficult one. So what, uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, design services, bidding services, and, and uh, uh, inspection services, and you know, we're talking about uh, $375,000 worth of stuff or so. Do we have any idea what the uh, cost of the project's gonna be? I mean, I know they're supposed to come up with some of it, but. Our, pre our preliminary estimates are right around $3 million is what okay. they are. And I believe back in 2015, I think Chuck, you and I talked about a little bit about this, that it was, they were talking about 5 million or more. My recollection was two to six was the. Yeah, that's correct. Very rough ballpark. That's what I recall as well. Yeah, for the total project. Yeah. Uh, from phase one through phase two. So we're looking at right around three right now for phase two. And again, we've got to get a little bit further into the design to really refine that. So mm -hmm. one example would be, um, we think roughly around a million is, is what we're trying to decide between for the building versus the um, machine that turns it into class A soil. And there's a little bit of variance between the two, but we won't know exactly until we make that decision after the study session to figure out what that cost is gonna be. So even at, even at 300,000 with all this, we're still within that 10 to 12% of the total project cost. And I think we've talked about those percentages before. It's, it seems like a lot of money, but it's still within that, that reasonable percentage of a project for design services and construction inspection. The question I got is if this was PEC, why is on-site construction even mentioned in it? Because it says, well, if they don't make the deal, we'll just renegotiate it. If they work over eight hours, then we're gonna pay one and a half. Why is that included in a contract that we're just doing the designers? That's what I have a problem with. Because by signing this, we're almost saying, yeah, we agree on that on-site construction as well. And no. This is their standard form contract, so they're expecting that when you enter into the design contract, normally they would expect that you're ready to proceed with construction. It's my understanding from the conversations with the commissioners five years ago that their intent was to engage for phase two at some point in time. That time and that scope of services had not yet been determined. And we know, we know internally as staff that we want to get to a point where we can have a study session with you and then ask for your permission to proceed when and we have more information. why is it included in this contract? Because if we sign it, what we're saying is, okay, if on-site works overtime, then we pay them time and a half. If on-site doesn't make the uh, timeline, and then we stop it and renegotiate, the same stuff that happened to us the first time, we got burnt. There are so many things in here, it just throws in on-site. If there's no way I could stand there and, and vote for it, unless we sit down as a group and discuss paragraph by paragraph and take out the points that don't even pertain to, you know, anything pertains to PC, I understand. But by throwing in on-site and signing this, we're <coughs> saying that's whatever they do is fine too. So, so you, you understand that, that PC, they provide the construction inspection services. So for example, in phase one, the engineering company had somebody there on-site observing Apex work all the time. And that, that's what this is saying it's for, is for somebody to be there observing, making sure that the quality control is what we, what we expect. This is not, the on-site that they're talking about is not somebody actually physically out there putting the pieces together or installing the work. That's a separate contract that we would work through after bidding. This is just the engineer saying, I'm gonna have somebody on-site to make sure that when they're hooking up the electrical, they're doing it correctly. And then why are sense? we paying overtime if they're working for them? They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're working not, for so us. They're, they're working for us. The way this is, okay, so if you look at this, and I don't mean to interrupt no, you. They're designing this, and so in, in these, what they're saying is, is we're gonna design this, and we need to oversee and make sure via our inspection services, that design is what's being done. So nobody's messing anything up. There's tons of different uh, permitting and different, uh, not zoning, but just a whole bunch of different things that have to come into play. And you know, they're not going to give us a design and then say, okay, let another engineer go ahead and make sure this is okay. That's not how that works. So this is for their inspection services. This is to make sure that what they the are giving to us if we decide to move forward with that actual construction is what is actually being built. Okay. okay then. So what they're saying is is that if we're out there, you know, over time, okay, if we're working more than eight hours, like essentially anybody else, there's gonna be a time and a half that comes into play. That's a contract with us. This has nothing to do with anybody out there putting anything in the ground or, or, or constructing anything. You know, Amy's not asking for this, nor does this contract call for any kind of construction. This is saying if we move into the construction phase, they have to be there on site, making sure that this is properly done. 
um, and that everything is, is up to par and up to speed when it comes to every single regulation and, and different thing that they have to have, and that the design is being, is being uh, fulfilled in the fashion in which it's been designed. And what is the part, point where they say if they don't make the 372 days or whatever, then it's renegotiated? That's, that's just, just what they did this last time. So, for example, the last time when, when APAC, the contractor, went over their days, we docked APAC for, for, their, for some of their work, but there was some of the work that was legitimate. That additional on-site inspection to ensure quality control was there was not included in their initial estimate, so they had to get paid more. So what they negotiated for was what kind of rate were they going to pay their inspector at that point in time. But then APAC ended up didn't pay us for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Two, two separate things, two separate things. So it, we had to negotiate with APAC. We, we implemented liquidated damages. We ended up having to settle, and we went through that conversation. But PEC, the engineer, still had to be there, and we had a supplemental agreement with them to continue the on-site inspection services with them because APAC was there extra long. We still want to make sure we're getting the product that, that we intended to get, and that's what PEC is there to do during that time. We have to pay them for that, in, that initial time, and, and they paid for the portion that was legitimate for APAC to be there legitimately longer. We did not pay for extra days that APAC caused and, and that we docked them for. Does that make sense? Well, except that the point, I, I understand they have to be there to oversee it. Mm -hmm. But why can't the thing be scheduled? So, I mean, why all of a sudden say someone just, well, I'm just going to stick around for another hour and I'm going to collect uh, time and a half and the city's going to pay for it? They can't. They, they have a log. They log everything that they do. out. Basically, a time on task log is what they fill out, what that on-site inspector fills out. And then they have to turn that in, along with their mileage and their mill tickets and everything. They have to turn that into PEC. And we can ask for that any time that we want to. So we know when they were there, what they were doing, what they were doing with their observations, who they watched, what work was done, how it was done, if it required co correction or not. We see all that. Was the thing set up for nine hours? I mean, a day? It's a, it, it's a handwritten log from what I've seen. So they'll say, like, from 9 to 11, I watched them pour this area in the grit chamber and made sure the rebar was covered by two inches, as, as an example. So they can write in more hours, however many hours the contractor works, they write in how many hours that they were there. So they're, they're automatically, they're saying that they anticipate their work out days are going to be nine hours, so they're automatically building in one hour of overtime a day mm -hmm. in there. Um, I don't know how that figures into the total scope of the project and the cost of the project because uh, sometimes when you do build in overtime and stuff and you get it done sooner, it's, there's a, a gain. Where are we seeing nine hours? On Sorry, ours. Yeah. On, on number four there. Number four. <laughs> but if, if they get it done sooner. Uh, they don't bill us for that, that inspection. The, the way this piece works, they only bill us for the hours that that contractor was on, on site. Right. And that's why they have it written as a not to exceed and item B at the top. They know that they're not going to go over that provided that the contractor stays within those 273 mm -hmm. days. Now the work like on the back end that you didn't see on phase one that we negotiated was, okay, if, if there's days that we're going to dock APAC for being there and it was well within their control, then they're going to pay the PEC engineer for those days. So all, all of that was worked into those lump sums that we brought back. Yeah, but if you. it does go over, it doesn't say how it's going to be settled. It right. says it will be negotiated. Yeah. So we don't know what it's going to cost. Right, but, but you're assuming then that, that the... We don't know what we're going to charge We'll have to deal then. with that at that time anyway, because if the project goes over 273 days, we'll also be dealing with the contractor at that same time. We're going to have to work through that. I don't, I, don't, I don't want the contractor to stop at 273 days if the job isn't done. So we're going to have to be able to work through that. If the contractor has to work 280 days, I don't want seven days without lack of inspection by the engineer mm -hmm. that designed the project. I so, want them on So there. which contractor are we going to have a time limit and then have a penalty if they don't make it? The person con constructing the project, the general contractor that constructs the project. Yeah. yeah. This, th this is the designer, this is just the inspector that's going to be there, and he has to be there whenever the contractor's there. Then w if, if we get to a point where we have to invoke liquidated damages on the contractor, we're going to make them pay for some of those overage days that, that they're there. So what my understanding about this, and, and the way I'm, I'm trying to make some sense of it, is we, we had a, a, a conflict during phase one in which the 
construction contractor did not fulfill the full obligation of their agreement, right? Yes. We did not have any issue or negative experience with PEC. Correct. They did their job according to the contract. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm, I think that there are valid concerns. I think there are valid questions about our ability to secure this project as a whole. I want to make sure that we aren't punishing one company for the fault of another. Um, I, I still I need to hear it again, kind of the difference between the, the numbers in four and five, and, and that would help put me at ease. But what I would like to, to focus on then is that if we're able to move forward with PEC, that we're able to focus more on our, our bid contract or, or however we frame that, such that we aren't in a spot where we have to settle for liquidated damages. I think that that's where we can tighten our screws a little bit such that we can protect ourselves from the liability that we experienced during during phase one. Yeah. And, and I think yes. that's what that's the main what point of what we're trying to do is, right? Yeah, yeah, and basically what this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but what this is saying is, is that for PEC, the uh, 273 days, that's what we're saying uh, the construction company that's going to be doing the actual work is going to have it be, have uh, for the project. And what this is saying is, is that if company X, Apex or whoever it is, doesn't uh, get it done in the 273 days, then we're going to have to, you know, talk about how we're we're going to go with these guys to beyond that. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so yes. I, I think that's so. And I think that's reasonable. What was, what was beneficial the in having this? Because the reason why you want to be able to go back to renegotiate that was in the situation yeah. we had previously. We had the, co the contractor who, who you know, had gone over, and then they were claiming all these crazy things, and this is why they wouldn't go over, and this is why they shouldn't have to pay liquidated damages, etc. So what happens is, is that we're sitting here dealing with them, but then they're sitting here, okay, we got to renegotiate this. But what we were able to do was knock out some of those days that they were there that they didn't need to be there. Yeah. So that's why you want to be able to renegotiate it. These guys go over this time, the inspector who's going to be there for X amount of days over time, that gives us the ability when we're dealing yeah. with the contractor to come back and say to the inspection services, here's what we've got going, and then we can negotiate with mm -hmm. them and deal with it from yeah. there, as opposed to having a hard line, yeah. I have to go over this, this is what you got to pay me. No, but, but you're missing the point. You stand there and you go over the days, and then you got to renegotiate. Now, if we go to the contractor and we have the terms set up, there has to be a way that those terms are tied in to the same payment, because it could come down. If all of a sudden the contractor, there's a penalty, and okay, we they they pay the penalty, but yet what we negotiate with the PC for being there extra time, is that penalty enough to cover our, what we're out as well as what we have that's to pay why, PC? That's, why we have negotiation. that's right. But, but how, how, do you how do you negotiate when you don't know what the other end is? It would seem that's to me that there'd be a way to create something in the contract with the contractor that any expenses or overages that we incur that, that we would hold final payment to where if we owe PEC an extra X amount of dollars, that that's in addition to, I mean, I think that that's, that's where we can not find ourselves financially responsible for that, is if we build that into our, our final payment, withholding final payment until all terms of the contract are agreed, then, then we're not out to PEC. PEC and the city of Concordia are in the same boat working with the contractor, and that would be a completely separate contract apart from this contract, right? Yeah. Now, that makes sense. Because That'll be addressed. Both ends. That'll be addressed with the construction yeah. company. Yes. 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 So I'm fine with this. Yeah. With this, if we're addressing with the yeah. uh, construction company mm -hmm. to have us covered for this, I see nothing wrong with this contract. Because what happened the last time is we didn't get all, we paid PC. Mm -hmm. but. We didn't collect all the money we were out and what we were out, so we ended up costing us. And I think that there are ways that we can we can learn from that and apply that to our contract with the construction contractor. 
because I think that that's I think that's appropriate. I think that's prudent. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I appreciate that. I think that the city of Concordia, not just as an entity, but other entities within the city of Concordia, have been burned with with have had experienced some difficulties with some recent contracts. So I understand wanting to preserve and protect, and be the best stewards we can of our tax dollars. I, I don't know that that's so we need to be careful with PEC as we do with any vendor. I understand that, but. PEC, I think, worked pretty well with us during phase one, and so I want to make sure we're moving forward respectfully with them while still making sure that we're protected as we move yeah. forward. Okay. Any further discussion, questions? Presentation? Any, <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off. No. Uh, does, it, does it make sense what we're asking you to, to uh -huh. authorize tonight is, is to get, get us down the next step? Yep with a formal agreement with PAC, and that way they can give us a little bit more information. Once we have that compiled, we'll set up the study session this fall. We'll go through the scope in detail, the, co the design cost in detail, the expected construction costs in detail. We'll have some decision points for you along the way, which include how to handle the biosolids. We'll also, at that study session, talk about um, the additional fee to the water bill, how much that may be, when do you want to implement that, what makes the most sense for us, especially given everything else that's going on in our community. And, and at those decision points in time, then that'll give us guidance as to how to proceed. Yeah. But the important thing is, I think, you know, I agree with you on this, and, and I can understand where, where they're coming from. I think it's, besides knowing the cost in the construction, I think the terms with our, the construction, the people actually doing the work, we're going to want to see it piece by piece this time, because that's where we got burned last time. And PC, yes, they worked with us. We paid them. And, and they got extra money because they worked over. So, I mean, yeah, it was the person that we didn't have the tight terms with on the whole thing that, that we got burned on. And that could happen again this time because PC is going to want their money. And I can't blame them. And when it comes down to negotiation, we think they're going to negotiate about the same way they did. But, but you don't know. But it really comes down to is we do this thing just besides talking the amount and everything else to me. How we write that contract and the terms of that contract with that con construction is going to be just as important as the amount mm -hmm. on this project this time. I move to authorize the city manager to enter into a contract with professional engineering consultants for $149,600 for design, bidding, and construction administration and for on site construction inspection not to exceed $223,000. $500 for a total of $373,000 and $100. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have a motion from Christy. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Keaton. All in favor say aye. I have one more question. Oh, okay. Sorry, Mark. Are we anticipating any on site construction mm -hmm. inspection prior to the study session? <clears throat> That, that will only occur after the contractor begins construction, which he will only start after you authorize the contract, which only happens after the bid, which only happens after it's designed. I just want to make it pretty clear that while, we're, while we are moving forward with approving this fairly large sum, mm -hmm. what we're really anticipating expending at this point is the 149 yeah. six. So mm -hmm. we're, we're approving a, a, a larger number, mm -hmm. but we're not anticipating any of that work to be completed until after we've had a study yes. session or well deep into this project. Right? Yes. Thank you. Point. Correct. Thank you. Uh -huh. I have a motion from Christy and a second from Keaton. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <coughs> Page two. <laughs> Good. Manager's report. Is that what you need next? The manager's report. Or do I need to sit down? I can sit down. If you need to. No, you <laughs> need to sit down and come back up. <laughs> no. <coughs> All right. We've, we've had a busy last couple of weeks. Um, first, we found out today that we will present to the kayak committee in Topeka on July 9th um, as a prerequisite for the CDBG funds grant application. And that's for the two blocks, uh, sanitary sewer, storm sewer, and alley replacements downtown. That is, um, the project's location for that is between Broadway and State, so two blocks, and in between 6th and 7th Street. So behind the plaza, behind Gambino's, behind 6th Street Fashions, behind the old Sears building, those two blocks are what we're talking about. 
we're experiencing some flooding in there. We're experiencing some collapsed, collapsed storm sewer in there and some crumbling um, sanitary sewer in that area. It's all over 100 years old, so it's time to, time to do some major work there. Um, total project is estimated at, at about $800,000, and the CDBG grant would get us um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of that, and the rest mm. would be paid for through capital improvement fund. We'll go through that in more detail during budget study session, but we have to present to this kayak committee, and then we work with North Central Regional Planning Commission on the actual grant application, then we find out several months from now if we get it, and then we go through the authorization project with the commission, much like this as far as design and construction. Um, the other thing that we did was we held a pre-design conference call last week with the airport runway project. We're working through some requirements there to make sure we understand exactly what it is that they need and exactly their processes. It's kind of it's kind of similar to the other airport improvement projects, but the rules of the game were slightly different because it's a slightly different program. So we're working through that. We met with the airport advisory board Tuesday evening to kind of share what we knew at, at that point in time with them as well, that we had the pre-design pre -design conference. Um, we should have a design contract ready for your consideration sometime here in, in late July. And the FAA did authorize us to proceed with Benish, our current airport planner, so we don't have to go out for RFP with them. They can finish this, this segment out, so that, that's good. I got one question on that. Yes. The KDOC, what did KDOC say when you asked them about the extension and the width on the original? We, we've not talked to them about it. One of the things that we're working through is that our application was for 3,700 feet long by 75 feet wide. And when we had the pre-design conference with, with FAA this past week, they told us 3,700 feet long and 60 feet wide is what we're approved for. So we're still working through to understand why they said we couldn't do the 75 foot wide because that's what we were led to believe all this right. time. And we need to get answers to those questions and, and make sure we know what we want before we go visit with KDOT and have them ask for their assistance with it. The other thing that we want to mention is that the launch of the Can Cycle Bike Share Program is scheduled for Monday, June 24th at 10 a.m. They'll be doing a ribbon cutting right outside um, City Hall here next to the 81 Connection bus stop. There'll be a bike rack place there. Installation was supposed to begin today. I honestly haven't been outside much. Yep, they were, they were out there when I came. Okay. Yep. I don't have any windows, so I stuck stuff in my hole there. All the bikes on the trailer in. Awesome. And I believe, I know, Christy, you're planning on being there for the mm -hmm. ribbon cutting. Mark and Sam, I know you're not able to be. Chuck, I know you're trying to see if your schedule I'm will check allow it. I'm to see if I had a Good. And I should be able to. Okay, wonderful. They, they may want you guys to actually get on a bike and help out with the inaugural bike ride, so go ahead and practice up the weekend before, if you don't mind, <laughs> bringing home with you. I'm not sure my tires are inflated anymore. <laughs> Who let the air out a little bit? It's been a while. <laughs> Um, finally, the, the repair of the sewer main up there between 2nd and 3rd between Spruce and Olive is progressing. Um, we really appreciate the Commissioner's quick action on Friday afternoon to authorize us to proceed. They had folks up there Friday afternoon going ahead and checking out the site. They had equipment there Monday late morning and they began work Monday afternoon. Um, today, they, as of today, they've had the line pulled through and installed and they made the connections to the manholes and they were doing some testing up there and that's why Jeremy's up there to make sure that the, they get the testing. They anticipate probably being done if all goes well here within the next few days. Um, and we did get the contract fully executed early this afternoon. Yeah, good. Good. So good. Everything was there. Are there any questions for me? Mm -hmm. all right. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Amy. Staff reports. Reno, got anything? Okay. Mayor and Commissioner report. Sam? Yeah, I just want to, you guys did real quick, quick job on uh, getting that street hmm. and then on the, on the cave in the whole thing and it was really yeah. it was really good of you especially on the weekend uh, unfortunately I think that could be just one of many and our city's getting old and they're starting to talk to us right now so I think it comes budget time we're gonna have to really take a hard look of where we're at on that can you knock uh, on some wood Sam the, the, <laughs> the other thing is uh, I'd like to see us uh, Discuss a couple of things that are brought to us uh, today and set up a discussion session on. And one of them is the uh, uh, BYU complaint about Fall Fest. You know, one, of, one of the things I brought that up when uh, we first came <coughs> to Plaza and they started talking about everyone can br bring their own booze, and my first comment was, well, what is the uh, people that sell liquor and uh, people like Easy G's and stuff like that have to say about this? I was told, oh, they don't care. Well, I, they probably don't on normal, on normal shows and movies and stuff like that. But when it comes to something like Fall Fest, evidently they do care and they are concerned. And I think that's something that we need to bring, bring up. If the other time is, I like, well, I think that 
we, well, we did set up the area where you could drink. I thought that was good. Yes, there were some problems that we need to work on. But by limiting it that you have to buy it, it does two things. It helps our businesses, which is good, because that's the biggest crowd there. Plus, it, you, you have some control of where the liquor is at. Instead of people just bringing it in all over, walking down the street with it and say, well, I'm going inside this area and the whole thing. So I think that's something that we really need to look at. Uh, if nothing else, just for the sake of our businesses that, uh, you know, Ty's right, he has supported the plaza and so has the other ones. And something like this, there's a lot of new people in town. A lot of people come to this thing and they need to take advantage of it uh, with the income on it. So it's something I think we need to put on discussion. As far as the weed thing, I don't know who's, who's that is. On that toxic weeds at Walmart, I don't know whose control that is. But if it is ours, we probably should do something. If no, not, no, that's my responsibility to get on that. Okay. Uh, okay. They, they change the manager. We we got them to go out there weeds before the spraying. Then they change the manager, and then the new manager just kind of neglects it. Out they should have fairly decent access to weed control supplies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sprayers. <laughs> Shouldn't be much that they're missing. No. So, but uh, that's about all I got. Chuck. Sure. Uh, I would I would agree with Sam um, and echo that I think having a, a discussion and, and whether it's specifically about Fall Fest or having some sort of relatively uniform application mm -hmm. of uh, how we handle or, or how <coughs> we encourage events to be handled it would be prudent. Um, there was a, a member of the um, airport advisory board approached me um, and and maybe has approached you, Amy, uh, asking about the potential about being able to set up a memorial um, out in Airport Park. Um, mm. I told him that I thought, uh, as he was talking about that, I didn't know that there'd be any reasons not to, but would bring it up. Yeah, uh, Blair come into the Airport Advisory Board meeting and asked us about it the other day. And his location he picked and everything, I didn't see no problem with it. So yeah. I'm gonna meet with him when he's ready to do it. And yeah. he's gonna select a place for a tree to the south of the camping stalls about halfway in between there and where Belden's old house was so at the first sorry, I thought they was for what? his, son passed, his son passed away oh okay okay I, I was, I was yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry so, so good yeah so he's just gonna call me and I'm gonna go out and look at it and make sure everything's okay and then just let him do it I, I never want to turn down someone who wants to um, offer a memorial um, really for anything but I think it is important for us to make sure that like I said it's not it's not in the way of this it's not in the way of that it, it makes sense in our, our kind of overall plan not to not to get persnickety about it but just to make sure everything flows so I, I, I right. said I didn't think it was gonna be an issue especially when you talked about where it was gonna be but I think it's it's good for us to have some discussion about those sorts of things just to make sure right. things in line is so at the first I thought they was wanting it up there by the hangers or something like mm -hmm. that and that would be more work. problematic okay. yeah <laughs> so okay okay Thanks, Thanks, um, is that it, Chuck? Yeah. yeah. That took care of one of mine. In fact, it took care of two of them. Uh, the, the Fall Fest thing, I think we do need to get together and talk about that. Uh, the BYOB, uh, usually people think bring your own bottles, but I, then I heard it was bring just beer or whatever. And just my thoughts are that if it's bring your own stuff and people are coming from out of town they'll probably buy it wherever they live and bring it with them so we'll miss out on the sales tax thing so i'd rather see but we can talk about that in the session um the uh other the the airport i've had a lot of comments from people uh the airport award and it's a very positive thing and people are excited about it people that don't have anything to do with the airport or use the airport but they recognize that it is a good deal so again great job to everybody in getting getting that um, fall fest uh, one of the things i'm concerned of uh, chief is reoccurrence of what happened last year you know the cornhole tournament was a great thing and i, and I think it's, it's it's wonderful uh but it just seems like uh, you know we had a few fights in town and uh as far as I'm concerned, throw away the key. I don't uh, think we can tolerate uh, any of that stuff. And you know, I, I know they used to give speeding tickets on holidays. They they ch charge you double. I think uh, you get arrested for fighting during Fall Fest. You get triple. 
So I wonder if the police uh, department would be interested in putting a team together. There you go. Just to have a presence. That would it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if maybe the police department wanted to would be interested in putting a team together <laughs> that might uh, deter for the cornhole cornhole tournament unlawful behavior. If so, you might have a chance with that though. It's just not some and <laughs> another thing I've I've uh, noticed, you know, I have people ask when we're going to do things about certain homes, but I noticed the one down across from St. Anne's home there on 5th Street is yeah, it the, gone. The, the and mud's finally letting the new equipment in, and, you know, and, and now with the good weather, it's got people are building terraces and you know, farming, and, and the, it's just busted wide open everybody. It's just swamped. Yeah, right yeah. Uh, I did have the owner of the one on 11th the one on Rocky Yeah. yeah. That's all I have. I've got any, nothing for this evening. <laughs> okay. Um, executive session, uh, confidential <coughs> business data. Uh, do we have a motion for that? Uh, who would need to be in attendance? Uh, we have the commissioners, Justin, Dave Barnes, and myself. And how long are we needing these? I would move that the city commission re What's that? <laughs> Wouldn't be real popular tonight. Sorry, <laughs> sir, you're in the wrong room. Uh, I move. I move to the the city commission recess into executive session to discuss confidential business data, trade secrets of a business, KSA seventy five forty three nineteen B four, with Amy Lang, Justin Farrell, Dave Garnis in attendance, and to reconvene in the city cha city commission chamber. At we'll say seven seven oh five. I'll second. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have a motion from Chuck and a second from Sam. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yeah, I know that's not safe. to return to executive session for the aforementioned purposes for an additional 10 minutes, reconvening in the city commission chamber at 7.15. Yep. I have a motion, second by Sam. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Oh, we have to, we have to say oh. no action. Okay. Okay, no action was taken in the executive session. I move to adjourn. Second. I have, I have a motion from Chuck, a second from Christy to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone.